church, and, and there are truly some things to be discouraged about. Um, real problems, real issues, and it seems to be one thing right after the other. And obviously we all know that soon to be now Justice Kavanaugh ha has went through a, a process none of us would ever want to have to go through. And, and, and I will tell you, even in the mix of that, when Lindsey Graham, if you've been following it, and he kind of had an outburst of emotion and, and, and really got upset, and he made a statement that stuck with me, and I'm thinking how sad, but how true. And he was talking to, uh, referring to Judge Kavanaugh, and he said, Sir, if you have come to this city for a fair hearing, you've come to the wrong city. Yeah. And that should not be named among us. I, I don't care what other nations want to do. We need to do the right thing. And we need to demand that our leaders do the right thing. And, and, and hopefully in this, I can share with you through the, through the eyes and the, and the life of Elijah, how even though discouragement may come, maybe we will know how to even hinder it from getting to us or especially know how to get out of it once we get there. And I'm going to use some very practical ways to do this. Um, kind of strange being on the stage right here. I'm used to being up there. But, but wow. I, I don't know whether to take it as a compliment or to be concerned because they seem to be pushing me away. And, and, uh, but, but I do appreciate Terry and, and, and Greg and, and Jeff and Mike. Uh, and Lauren, the, these guys came together and put this thing in. It actually looks pretty good. I was afraid it was going to be a mess, but they really done a good job on it. And, and I, I didn't need another discouragement in my life. I did not want to walk in here and, and say, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to hurt someone's feelings if, if this thing is, is, is not, especially if it's not centered up, then we would be in a world of trouble. So... We, we've got a lot of the things that are hindering us and that's causing us to be discouraged. In the book of, of uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, we find a, a story that's playing out. Now, many of us may not be familiar with 19, even though we've read it, but we all are very familiar with chapter 18. Chapter 18 is when Elijah may have been at the pinnacle of his life. I mean that every devil in the universe seemed to be coming after Elijah and he withstood and he stood strong and he focused and he whipped them all, of course, through the help of God. He called upon God. God delivered. Elijah was walking probably more in the power of God or at least he felt he was at that very moment of his life than maybe any other time in his life. And then chapter 19 comes. Chapter 19 is quite a contrast to chapter 18. We see an extremely high followed by an extremely low. And as I began to talk and begin to pray over the last month and probably have had too much time to think about it, I begin to, to, to think about this nation, this world, the, 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 the condition of the church. And it, and it appears what the Lord began to show me was in chapter 18 was kind of like the way the church used to be. And when I say used to be, and I'm not meaning all the glamour and, 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 and all the healing services, but anyway, it was filled with people that used to know how to get in touch with God, to get a hold of God, and we'd see some powerful things happening in the churches, and we've seen people walking in the power of a holy God. 
And now we hear, we're here today, and it appears the churches went from chapter 18 to chapter 19. Now we're in a state of fear. Why? Be uh, why do I think that? Because we're no longer walking in the power of God. Not only is the church, but most of us as individuals are not walking in the power of God like they used to. Now, I don't want to talk about what they used to do because I don't live in the used to. I live in the now, so we're going to have to figure out how to turn the tide and get God back relevant and working in a manner in which when we know that we call upon the name of God, He's going to be quick to answer. And we're going to be so in touch with God that we're going to be able to ask whatever is in His will. And He says, if you ask whatever in his will he will answer that's where we're going to have to get back with God and I will tell you it's going to take some work to reverse this thing because we are definitely living in chapter 19 today and if you don't think so how many young people do you see on fire for God how many young people are flooding the altars? How many people are, are flooding the, the, the churches saying, God has called me to do this. God has called me to do that. God's called me to preach. God's called me in the mission. God is calling me. No, they're exiting the church. And there's a reason. And it's not the young people. It's the church. So, let's go to chapter 19. I'm going to read this. Hopefully you can go over it a time and again and, and begin to think about the service and the sermon. And before I read it, let me, let me add this. For quite a few years, I, I'm thinking since 2010 I've attended a conference in, in Asheville, North Carolina at the Cove Billy Graham Training Center and this conference has nothing to do with anything but revival heart cry for revival and they've got speakers that, that are experts on revival. And one in particular, he's not, he, he's not only, in my opinion, an expert on revival, but he probably has the largest library in the nation that deals with history of revivals, not only in America, but in Europe and different places. His name is Richard Owen Roberts. And, and I'm telling you, he preaches and teaches with such a, a, an anointing of God. And I've had the opportunity to sit in his classes, to hear him preach, and, and to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with him. And I remember whether he was telling me or I was reading in one of his books or a flyer he had out or something, he began to talk about... Uh, the things of revival and, and, and an era of time how during, during the time I guess the first great awakening the church or, or, or revival was just burning up the, the, the world Europe and America uh, especially in America and um, and he made the statement that God began to deal with these great revivalists on the issue of slavery. And because they, they wouldn't deal with slavery, the, the revival kind of fizzled out. Well, then you, you jump all the way to 1787 and we form our constitution in this nation. And one reason that they were having trouble getting the constitution ratified, they needed nine of the 13 states, was this issue again, slavery. And there was a, 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 a congressman, he was a black congressman, he stood up and he made the statement and, and he, he, he said that if... Um, if, if we don't deal with slavery now, we're going to have to deal with it later. And several other people made statements of that nature. Well, because the church did not get involved in dealing with this, 
Now we fast forward to 1860, 64, we have the Civil War. And in that, we have six to 800,000 men lose their life. Now, let's jump all the way to 2018. Here we are at 2018, and, and hopefully we've just seen the nomination and soon to be Justice Kavanaugh. And most people are quite confident all of this ruckus has been over life. So there's a good chance because of all of our prayers, not only yes on one has been refused to be here in the Supreme Court, so that will stand in Tennessee, but now, yet, but, but now we may have the opportunity to reverse Roe versus Wade. But it's having to be taken care of on the political platform. So here's the problem. If we get it overturned, thank God. But it's going to come at the price of 60 plus million babies. Now, that is discouraging from people like me that life is so important and I think about this every day. But you know, I'm going to have to put that behind me, our mistakes. We'll pay for it, but I'm going to have to put that mistake behind me because I've got to learn to, to move out of this discouragement. And whatever it is that, that we've messed up in the past in the church, we are going to have to fix this, put it behind us, not stress over it, and start from this day forward putting the right foot in front of the other. Now, let's go to the book. 1 Kings 19. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and, and also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. Now listen right here. We just left chapter 18 that he whipped all the prophets of Baal. And now chapter 19, he's running for his life. You better believe there's some discouragement coming. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Not only has he discouraged, now he wants his life to end. If it can happen to Elijah, you better believe it's visiting us, if it hasn't already. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. You remember this. Then he looked, and, he, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank, and he lay down again. There's another good point. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. Now I'm going to tell you, there are, are, are things that is getting ready that, to be asked of us and is being asked of us that is going to require more energy than maybe we've ever had to, to use maybe in our life. Let's just keep reading. Verse 9, And there he went to a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? 
So he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and seek to take my life. Now Elijah thinks he's by himself, but he's not. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rock in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a still small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord of God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my face." Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son over Nishma, the king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Meloah, shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Now I want to stop there just again for a moment. Elijah was discouraged. He thought he was alone. We just read that he wasn't alone. There were 7,000. Now, there, there's two things going on here. One, Elijah was having a little pity party, and he thought that everyone had forsaken him. And part of the reason that he might have been thinking that is because the 7,000 were silent. No one was saying anything. I am telling you, there is something to be said about speaking and standing. Someone, and God always has people that he's asking to stand and speak. Let's go on. Verse 19. So he departed from there and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was playing with the twelve yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the twelve. Then Elijah passed him, and he threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and mother, then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? So Elijah turned back from him, took the yoke of oxen, slaughtered them, boiled their flesh, using the oxen's uh, equipment. They gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. In chapter 18, Elijah is on cloud nine. In chapter 19, he is as far in the valley as you can get. And I will tell you, I believe that's where the, chair, the church is today. It does not have a clue who she is. The church is steeped in an identity crisis, thinking that, I, I don't know, they're waiting for God to sprinkle some kind of miracle dust on us that's going to cause us to be victorious again. It's going to take some work on my part and your part in order to get things back motivated and flowing again so that God can now once again bless the church, the church in America and the church in the rest of the world. But it's going to, be, it's going to take some work. It's going to take some real work. Today we're all caught up with thinking that God's only in the big stuff. And I will tell you that if you are, are involved in anything of much importance, there's a good chance that either you feel like you're alone or you're only in part of a small group. And it can get discouraging. So you get discouraged, you eventually stop doing the work. 
And we can't afford to stop doing it. So what is the answer to discouragement? So I want to take this from a biblical perspective, but also from a personal perspective, and also an observation that I'm reading from people and watch some people get through these things on their own. Make this very practical and very relevant for you and I. In this we find the first thing that, that Elijah had to do, not only was he, he, he should have looked at himself, but the, the angel came to him and, and to ask him, what are you doing? He give, gave the whole spill, and then they said something, you must get some food and you must get some rest. Hmm. I'll tell you before this is over, it may sound like an infomercial more than a, than, than, a, than a sermon. But I will tell you, this, there is so much truth in this, not because I'm a model citizen of this, but because I'm the opposite of this. If you're not sleeping and eating properly, you're not going to be much use to God nor anyone else. That's a fact. You can argue that all day long. Listen, I have lived that side of it and, and still living it. So the first thing, you need to get some proper nourishment. And I am not talking about hamburger and french fries. Now, again, I am not the model child in this, but I am trying... And I'm making some huge gains. And there are some people out here in this audience that can get you hooked up with some things that will help you. You might think, well, Pastor, look at yourself. You're getting plenty of food, the wrong food. Not only that, do you realize there, there, there are, 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 some of our food are having traces of this poison that's in Roundup? That's messing with their mind. It sure is not making the cells uh, 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 in, in a state of where they can absorb the good nutrients that they need. So proper diet. Now let me, let me tell a little story on myself. The ladies meet here every Tuesday. And they have their prayer. And, and I try to be here. I'm, I'm here at least half the Tuesdays. I don't bother them, but, but I'm here. And, and um, I came in one Tuesday because if they're praying for anyone, I promise you they're praying for me and they're praying for Pastor Moses. I, I've heard them pray too many prayers for, for the both of us. And that day I walked in and I made the statement and I, after I made it, I thought, oh my, I made the statement, I'm done with Diet Mountain Dew. Well, I thought that they was going to have a hallelujah shouting time service to hear me say that I was done with Diet Mountain Dew. Now, I didn't want to deceive them and I didn't mean to deceive them, but they were so happy I didn't want to tell them the truth. Because what I meant, because what PepsiCo was doing through Doritos, who also makes Diet Mountain Dew, I was in total opposition, so I decided I was not going to consume or drink anything that was from Pepsi, so that meant Diet Mountain Dew. So I said, I'm done with Diet Mountain Dew. Well, they didn't let me finish. They started praising God for this. And I'm thinking, but I'm going to drink Diet Coke. <laughs> But I couldn't tell those ladies that. How would you like to face 20 or 25 of these ladies that are on cloud nine? The pastor is trying to finally pray to. Do you know what I did for the next two weeks? I snuck my drinks into work. And I would drink in secret. Until I eased it back in and they knew the pastor fell off the wagon, then I could start putting them back in the fridge again. But the Lord began to deal with me on this about five weeks ago. And He began to tell me, Roger, I can't help you until you start trying to help yourself. And he began to flood my mind with so many people at this church that are offering to help me. And I'm thinking, I mean, I find things hanging on my door 
that if a pastor, if you'll take this, you won't have gout anymore. Well, I want my shrimp. And the Lord is saying, I can't help you. And I will tell you that if you're bombarded with all of these health issues and things, you're going to get discouraged. That's a fact. But not only that, but sleep. Some of you know, but what most of you don't know is I have no idea up until three weeks ago or two weeks ago, I have no idea what a good night's sleep feels like, and I've not for 30 years. And matter of fact, three weeks ago, I'm standing here in a service, and it had been four days since I'd even had any sleep. And I come here every Sunday morning for the majority of my life of pastoring this church, not having one moment of sleep the night before. And if you think you can function properly, you learn to get by, but if you think your body can function properly, trust me, it cannot, and that I am an expert in. So, so I'm, I'm beginning to ask the Lord, okay, Lord, I'm not taking the drugs. So you're going to have to help me with this. And sure enough, for the last two or three weeks, I've, had, I've enjoyed more sleep and better sleep than I have in 30 years. And matter of fact, my wife comes to bed the other night and she's talking to me and I'm thinking, Lord, would you help me stay awake so she doesn't get upset at me? Next thing you know, I was gone. Actually, I think she kept talking until she went to sleep and, and finally fell asleep and didn't even know I wasn't listening to her. So you're going to have to get proper rest and proper nutrition. I know that sounds like an infomercial and that, sound, that doesn't sound anything scripturally based, but I just read to you from Elijah where they told him, lay down, get some sleep, get this food because Elijah, Elijah, you've got a journey that if you don't have the strength, you're not going to make it. Now when the Lord begins to show you, if you don't do something, you're not going to make it, you'll start making a life change in your life. Especially the, the desires of your heart. You can have the desire. But if the body won't go, the body's not going to go. And a desire is not enough to get you where God wants you to be. Just because you desire the good things of God, just because you desire the work of the ministry, does not mean you'll be productive in it if your body is going to hinder you in it. Especially when I have no excuse. So we're working on that. And now the Lord begins to, to show me that I need to be examining myself. And I'm reading about other people that, that they're actually writing articles about these things. And bringing this spiritual side and look at some pastors who have already done that and, and walked through this and trying to see what they're saying and what they've done. Because once you get the strength in you, folks, let me tell you, you may not want to believe this and that's your prerogative and, 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 and I, I totally believe that we are in the last days. And being in the last days, understanding that God has placed you and I here for such a time as this. If we're not, going, if we're not careful, we're going to allow the devil to take us out of the game through things called discouragement. And then we can't even get our minds clear because they're cluttered with everything else. It's been a long month with the Lord in this sermon. Because what I realized when I began to examine myself, my focus was not on God. You know what it was on? The work of God. Hmm. The work 
of God. Or this or that. So I began to realize my focus cannot be on the work. It must be on the one. Now, when we start getting these perspectives in order, we're going to learn how to handle discouragement. Actually, we may stop it before it gets to our house. Warren Worsby wrote, Elijah wanted something accomplished that was loud and big. But sometimes God prefers that which is still and small. These are small things. It is not for us to dictate to God what methods He should use. It is our duty only to trust and to obey. I agree totally with that statement. So we're going to have to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves the best that we can. And I'm telling you, in this small church, the Lord has flooded us with, with people. Guys, two weeks ago, I guess it was, I was standing at that door hanging on for dear life because I couldn't walk. My ear had completely messed with my equilibrium and I could not walk. I mean, it's swollen shut. I've got everything I know to do for it. And lo and behold, here comes Donna and hands me uh, some kind of concoction. And, and I don't read it because I'm afraid it might be something for one of her horses. But, but I'm just going to trust her. I put that stuff in my ear and three hours later it's better. Which leads me to the last point. And I may get a little more personal. Is we're going to have to enlist help. If you're like me, you don't like that part about Christianity. I love family. I like the thought of family. But I like doing things my way, on my time, the way I want to do it. And I really don't want any help. That's not only a good attitude, it's not a biblical attitude. Now, maybe in another sermon we can go down the path of, 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 of who's your first go-to people. And if you know me well enough, one thing I rarely will ever do is ask for help. And I'm not talking financial help. I'm, I'm probably going to be on my starvation before I'm going to ask for financial help. And you may not, and you're better off than I am. My pride gets in the way. But I mean just help. I began to think about the church and, and my goodness from where we are now to where we were 15, 16 years ago when I felt like I needed to micromanage and now I've got people stepping up that's doing the teachings, doing the preaching. I've got, I've got people that's doing the Wednesday night teaching, the Wednesday night prayer. That's come right alongside because there's some things that, that I know God has birthed in my heart for the last 15 years that I can't make that mark because I've got too much, too many things, too many parts that are, that are working that's keeping me away from that. So now I'm beginning to enlist people and, and people at this church have stepped up and, and there can be emergencies happen in this church and I no longer have to be here to take care of those emergencies. And I thank God for these people that are stepping up and doing this. What, what greater honor could you be giving me than to be taking care of these duties for me? 
But not only on the, the, the spiritual part of it, but now the physical. Most of you know that, that I'm in a building project. And when I say I'm in a building project, I'm building a house, you're probably thinking of the average size home here. No, I'm building a small home. Bigger than I wanted. Smaller than my wife wanted. But a compromise we made. 750 feet. I mean, you know, I, bought, I, I sold my 1,800 square foot. Now I'm living in a basement and a two-story home above the basement. And, and, I'm, and I'm wanting to go back to this 750. But in this, this process, because... I'm going somewhere with this. I'm, I'm getting things in place so that I can be used and this church can be used in a greater way in the near future, hopefully. And, and during this, we decided to do this. So we sold our house a couple years ago. And, and then we started thinking about building. The Lord began to impress on me and my wife, I want you to do this without a mortgage. And I said, Lord, you know I'm not asking anybody for money. I'm not going to do it. Anything outside of number 11 written in stone, it's not going to happen. If you want me to do it, you better add to the 10 because I'm not going to do it. And that's when the Lord began to deal with me, then do it yourself. And I began to try. Now, this is a guy that said, okay, I'm going to build this house myself. And if you're not a builder, you don't understand what I'm saying. But if you are a carpenter, you understand it. I don't even know how to build a corner. That takes three boards. And you do something and you make a corner. I'm going to build a house and I can't even build a corner. How foolish is that? Now, I do know how to do a few little things like dig a hole in the ground if I can borrow somebody's backhoe. So, I'm sure I'm going to do this. I'm still not comfortable asking people to come and help me. But let me tell you what the Lord has done. The people would drive by or find out that I was going to be over there working and they just showed up and began to help. And then I talk to other people that know. Now listen, when you enlist help, if you've got a medical condition, don't call Terry. He's not medically inclined. He might help you with music, even building. But you probably don't want him to be operating on you or telling you what medicines you need to be taking. Find someone that knows what they're talking about. This guy called me and he said, Pastor, you know, if you would do this, 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 and this, and let me show you what you can do here, then okay. I, I said, all right, I will do that. I will, I will not build that part. I'll get a guy come and do this for two days. Sounds like good advice. Hopefully it will be great advice. I enlisted his help. And now I've got people that are not only helping, they've completely taken the project over. Because they know I would never ask them to do that. But finally I got so comfortable enough, I basically did ask. You got to enlist the help. And I've not named any names, but there's two more people and I'm not going to name their names either, except for one of them. One person overheard what I was wanting to do, and he overheard that I wanted to do this mortgage free. And he came to me and he said, Roger, I think if you want to, it's going to cause a little more work on you, but if you want to do this, then I can show you how you can do this mortgage-free. 
not only did the Lord orchestrate all of that, but this person even completely changed his entire work schedule so that I could do that. Nothing I would ever ask. But then there's one more person, and I didn't give any, any honor to this person because they were sitting here in the early service, and I wouldn't ever embarrass her. But is my wife. Over the last two or three weeks, she has done stuff for me that is completely out of her character. She would never chose to do but she's in this with me because and, it, and it's not about being mortgage free but it's about not having that burden with that so that we can free up more time and resources to do the things for God folks a few weeks ago I, made, I preached a sermon about God is making some huge changes well he's made them in my life and I have been surrounded with great people from this church that has made this happen because either I enlisted or you just knew what I was doing and you wanted to be part of it. I say that to say this. Just as Elijah enlisted Elisha, you can't do this alone. We've got a, a church in America, and I'm, and I'm talking about the remnant. But they're all doing, we're all doing our own thing. And sometimes we need the help of others. And here's the thing. When Elijah enlisted Elisha, it not only helped Elijah, but it also blessed Elisha. We're going to have to do this. And if we will do this, then we'll be able to work through these discouragements because here is what will happen and I'll say it again I said it at the first if you are discouraged and you walk away and you don't give any thought to it and you're, you're waiting for God something big to, to, to change your life that something big is probably not going to happen. It's going to be the small things that are going that are right in your daily life and you don't even recognize them. And and if you choose to to not grab a hold and you you start walking in discouragement, you'll find yourself like Elijah. You'll go from the mountaintop to your running. Listen, he whipped 450 prophets of Baal and ran from a woman because of fear. So if you don't, if you don't do something to turn this around. Something productive. Yeah, you'll still attend church and you'll still read your Bible and you'll still participate in worship. You'll still teach the lessons, preach the sermons, sing the songs. But you'll finally wake up one day and look and see that you have absolutely stopped serving God. You're no longer in the fight. All you can do is hang on to your life. And the Lord has given us and shown us how we can do this.
And I will tell you, I'm an expert in hiding it. I've stood here and preached. I've talked to you before. I've, I've cut, cracked jokes with you before. And so discouraged, I didn't know what I was going to do next. So I can hide it. Thank God if you don't hide it. And still love God, not question that at all. But realize I'm no longer serving Him. I'm not working for Him. And I think the apostles, it's, it's kind of an unknown uh, statement that is, that is made or it's, it's, it's uh, implied anyway when they would say John or, 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 or Jude or, or Paul or James, a servant of God. Instead of an apostle of God, they said a servant of God. In other words, they said I must never lose the attitude of serving Him. Serving God. Don't stop serving God. But I don't care how committed you are, if you're constantly, and I know we have valleys in our life. I'm not talking you can't have a moment of, of where things are just, uh, just seem to be out of control in your life. But when we're just staying in the valley and we can't ever get out of there, don't stay there because you'll become discouraged and I will promise you, you will not work for God. You won't do it. That's why our kids have left. That's why no young people are being called. Is because, because we are sick, we're discouraged, we're stressed, and we can't show the power of God. We love God and we're faithful. We are going to, we're going to come and we're going to do. But we no longer work. I, I, I can't keep going. It's been a month and it's been a while and, and I've been working a long time on this sermon. As Christy comes, this started about six weeks ago, as I said. A person sent me a song by Mercy Me, Even If. As she sings this, I want you to look at your life. I want you to listen to the words. I want you to talk to the Lord, whether there or here, wherever. Get down to business with God. But also listen to this song. <laughs> 